Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Find the perfect gift. And wow the people you love. Wow. Wow. This is amazing. Whether you want to say happy birthday. So cute. Or I love you. I love you too. Thinking of you. Wow. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Celebrate the people you love. Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. I'm not satisfied when I learn something new unless I share it forward. And so we created this podcast to continue that, to share forward the wonderful people we get to meet and most importantly get to learn from and make our lives richer and better. Together we'll cover the human experience. And for me, the human experience is foundational in the idea of relationships. The topics will be far reaching, but common element you'll see here is it's all about relationships. So I invite you to join us on this journey. Come experience it with us, share your thoughts and ideas, and become part of our community. We'd love to have you. Natalia Barinsky is the daughter of Polish and Ukrainian immigrants and has been immersed in multiculturalism from day one. She's an acclaimed journalist, communications expert, and global citizen who has worked everywhere from the Huffington Post to the U.S. Embassy in Sweden to her current role at the Stockholm-based Klarna. In this episode, Natalia and Jim discuss the power of storytelling, how Natalia's upbringing shaped her worldview, and her takes on current events such as the war in Ukraine, the revolution in Iran, and global climate change. Listen in on Celebrations Chatter. Hey there, Natalia. How are you? How are you? Good. I am well. I haven't seen the sun in months, but <laughs> I'm still keeping up spirit. <laughs> I always look forward to talking to you because you're always so upbeat. And in these gray days, we need upbeat. <laughs> yeah, let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, w- w- were you born in Chicagoland? Yes, I was. I was born on the south side of Chicago, Polish mother and a half Polish, half Ukrainian father. Uh-huh. And they were immigrants to the U.S., so I'm first generation on both sides of my family born in the U.S. and very much had the experience of, you know, working multiple jobs. I was being primarily raised by my grandfather because my parents are trying to make ends meet. My mom actually, I remember very vividly when I was nine, um, graduated night school. So she was working by day doing night school and ironically, was also a community organizer for the Democratic Party there. So very reminiscent kind of a la Obama days. But one of my favorite experiences with her was going door to door for the party and kind of meeting neighbors, talking to them. I mean, those experiences and what I knew what politics was, was very much about empathy, community, really listening. And it was A challenging, but I would also say wonderful childhood. Uh, You talk, uh, I've heard you talk about that childhood. And I remember that your mom uh, would take you to work. You're you're a little four year old, five year old, and the the nanny was sick that day. Exactly. (laughs) The proverbial nanny. (laughs) And what what influence did that have on you? Uh, You're sitting there four years old, five years old, you're sitting desk side with your mom. Uh, She's working hard, going to school at night. We know we know the kids are even if they don't think they're listening, they're listening and they're yeah. learning. What were you listening to? What were you learning? Do you think then? I would say a few things. I mean, my mom, God bless her heart, was direct, so she'd basically say, "I have to work, <laughs> sit in the corner, and do something, and be quiet." And I would actually write these stories. Like I found a love of writing early. I would observe the other people in the office, and it was kind of a very diverse group of people and write stories about them. And that kind of grew into something that I love to do. I would also say from a young age, I had an obsession with getting a job. <laughs> like At five or six, I was going around the neighborhood saying I could dog sit, cat sit, babysit. I think I started applying for internships, obviously that I could not do, but by the age of eight, nine, 10, really creating things. Like I saw work not as a burden I saw my mother happy at work I saw it as another community a place you can make a difference a place where kind of as a woman you would find self-worth my mom was the breadwinner in our household um, and her mother before that so I think that had kind of a real impact on me just this steely work ethic and also 
using my imagination. I think as a mother now, I think about that. We really over schedule our kids. They have to be in all these activities. They're online, they're doing this. And I kind of always knew at a young age, both instinctually and by experience that I wasn't going to be over scheduled. I had to create my own opportunities. I had to make things out of the silence or out of the boredom. And I think that gave me a very kind of sense of entrepreneurialism in some way. It's interesting. You talk about we overschedule the kids now, and clearly we do. And I'm, when I say we, I'm as a grandparent, I'm, I'm thinking about, I, I cannot believe how scheduled my grandkids are. <laughs> and, but that's not just them. It's every, uh, every kid now. And here you were, you had hours, hours <laughs> of unstructured time without an electronic device, I'm assuming. Uh, you had to think and learn and entertain yourself. And just, I wonder, as a contrast, I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other, but it certainly is different. And you have a, a passion for uh, communicating with people. You have a passion and an ability as a storyteller and as a writer. Uh, I assume that those early years where you had unstructured time by yourself. Okay, you're in a room with a bunch of adults, but you're by yourself. I wonder how that contributed to that those passions, those interests, and those skills that have served you so well as a young adult. I think it actually completely shaped them. I mean, I remember, and this is a very immigrant thing, but you know, the word bored is almost like a swear word in my household. Like when I say, mom, I'm bored. What are you talking about? How can you be bored? Go do something. (laughs) It's very ingrained in me that no boredom and, you know, no rest. (laughs) So that's actually, you know, something I work on a little bit is, is to have balance. But it's true. I think, you know, we don't give our kids a break to just not think or think differently. Um, When they're bored or sitting around, they're online and TikTok or Instagram is giving them things to think or entertaining them. And I worry how that will shape them. I think this generation is, is still creative, but I think there's this sense that, I mean, I think I would say there's a lack of like that opportunistic sense that I really knew, you know, I don't want to be bored. If I want to achieve things, if I want to go to certain schools, if I want certain jobs, I knew I actually had to do it on my own. I had to create those opportunities. My mom, my mom was full of these phrases, but she used to say, you know, if you don't like the house you were given, build your own, like create Mm -hmm. those things for you. And that determination. And I think that knowledge, it wasn't harsh. It was actually, you know, really motivating. And I think as parents and the definition of parenthood now is you're a bad parent if you're not there all the time and you're not there to support them and catch them and schedule them. I'm not sure if that's good. Um, I've always been a working mom. It's funny, you know, I, I, as we all know, the mom guilt, like when I was traveling or, or working or away from her when she was young, I was eaten up by guilt to the point where I remember even getting on a plane to fly over to Sweden or London from Washington, D.C. and almost having panic attacks. Like, I'm so guilty. I'm a terrible mom. She's not going to be okay without me. But she is such an independent, mature young woman, um, I think far beyond sometimes her peers, well, all mothers think that, right? But it's even more interesting because the things that I was guilty about, she now does school projects on. Like last week, my proudest day was both her and one of her friends wanted to interview me for a project on women's empowerment and gender parity in the workplace. And this is your 13 year old precocious (laughs) daughter. (laughs) I believe her quote was actually like, we need to revolt in society to oh make sure- Oh my goodness, what are you creating? <laughs> <laughs> I in, in our own image, right? But um, looking back at my mom too, as you mentioned, you, she was working a lot. She wasn't, she wasn't home a lot, you know, especially in my early first 10 years. But when I look back, like I had a wonderful child. I learned so much from her. She's my hero, you know so many of the values that she espoused are the things that I think that I'm most proud of about myself. And so it's, it's an interesting dynamic. I think what society tells us, what we tell ourselves and just having the courage to 
define your own version of success or parenthood and go against the grain. It, it's always best to be authentic that way. I'm not uh, sure if this is a correlation. So let me let me pull on a thread here a little bit with you. Uh, I know you you like to write, you're good at writing, and you're a good storyteller. Do you are you creative? <laughs> That's a good question. My inner self critic right now is is bumping like no, 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 but I think I am, and I think I, I've I've had to be. I didn't grow up with money or established family or a fancy last name or anything like that. I've I've really had to create things. And Are you I would a creative say, thinker? Well, can I you sit down know. and can you can you uh, spin a story of a uh, uh, fiction? I think I could, and I think I'm yeah. creative, especially professionally, like. Almost all of my jobs and anything I've done in my adulthood, I've created those roles. They didn't exist before. They were building something new or, you know, they were a new type of role within an organization. So I I do think that I have a mind that I can see a problem and I can see how I could be part of that to fix it. Or I can see something that's lacking and I can try to fill it. Maybe not all the time I'm creative, but I I do believe so. I think also growing up as an only child, I didn't have siblings. I didn't, I think must have had a hundred imaginary friends whose stories I would tell in my own head. And I kind of saved myself from loneliness that way, telling stories, thinking of crazy ideas. I mean, I I would say, I guess I'm creative in that sense. Well, uh, let's continue on that thread. You'd make up friends and stories. As a kid, did you fantasize? Did you did you have these elaborate stories in your mind when you didn't have something specific to do? Where would your mind go? Would you imagine things, imagine yourself in different circumstances? 100%. I would fantasize and I would even say I would manifest sitting at home 8, 9, 10, or even 16. You know, I would think in 10 years, I want to have this and be doing this kind of thing. And and you know what's funny? Like a lot of those things actually happened, you know, or even in in roles. I remember when we lived in Stockholm and my ex-husband and I, you know, we would brainstorm and just think like, wouldn't it be great if we could have this kind of visit and like create this kind of new activation? Do you still fantasize? Absolutely. Uh, I fantasized as a kid. I'm the oldest of five, so it wasn't wow. lonely. It was noisy <laughs> around the house. But and I was having this discussion with my son recently, and I said, he said, "Well, do you still fantasize?" I said, "To entertain myself, I still do." And like you, so many of the things I fantasized about have come true. So I don't want to stop fantasizing because I want more things to come true. I even, I think I do it every night as I go to bed. Um, sure. It's my peace. Like, I think that was my safe space as a child and a little bit of a chaotic childhood. And I was telling my daughter a few months ago, you know, she couldn't fall asleep without a device or watching something. And she said, what should I do? I said, you know, tell yourself a story. Like, think about, I think I'm going to embarrass her now. I think she had was liking some boy at the time. I said, tell yourself a story of like, what would it look like if that boy took you out to the movies and what would you wear? (laughs) It was this whole, I want to, I was trying to connect with her because she's not going to be fantasizing about work or anything like that. But she came to me a few months later and said, mom, that really worked. It's, it's fun. Like, I think we don't teach our kids that anymore. And it's almost wrong to fantasize. Like you should be busier, you know, what you should be doing. I think you're so right there. And I think what you learned instinctually by circumstance, I wonder, I had the, the, a treat yesterday morning. I was uh, going from my home on Long Island into Manhattan, and I jump on the Long Island Railroad, and who comes up behind me but my son-in-law. So he's married <laughs> to my daughter, Aaron. He's a wonderful guy. We were talking about how scheduled the kids are. We sat together on the train, and then we took the subway uptown together. And it was a real treat to have you know an hour with my son-in-law just to get caught up and I was a weekend. Where were you? You know, Mary Lou and I were away and we flew back on Sunday. And so we were trying to catch up on all the kids activities, but I mean, structured. And we had the conversation, part of our conversation on our catch up yesterday, Joe and I had was this conversation as we drift into what do we do as parents, as a grandparent or 
my kids' parent or you, uh, about regulating the amount of time they spend on devices. Because when they're uh, watching, uh, uh, when they're on a TikTok or when they're on a, a YouTube Reels or Instagram, th- their minds are, uh, are structured, they're programmed, they're, it's so passive, they're not being uh, proactive in terms of developing that creative thought process. And, and I worry about what how that might retard their development of their creativeness. I think that's such a good point. And I've even gone so far as to, to ruminate upon the fact that it's almost creating like all of these social media platforms. It's taking away their ability, not, not only to be creative externally, but with their own identity. You know, there's a certain culture on TikTok of this is what you're supposed to dress. This is where you're supposed to shop. These are the facial movements you're supposed to make. This is how you're supposed to dance. And I joke yeah. with my daughter, I'm like, you know, when I was young, you know, everybody was like eclectic. There were the goth people, there were this, there were, pre- you know, you kind of developed your own style and persona and they are told what to do and how to be and how to look. And I think that's also a little bit scary. It's a language and a culture and it's it's global. This type of thing spans across the world. And I, I toy with taking it away. Um, Pandora's box is open. It's really hard to take it away. But I do try to understand that language because I think as a parent, if you don't know what's going on on TikTok or if you don't watch these your child is speaking a different language and culture and you're not part of it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think you're right. There needs to be a balance there, Natalia, in the sense that uh, her peers are going to know what's going on there. They're going to be involved. It's all about balance, isn't it? Absolutely. That's a hard thing for me. I would say right now in my life, I'm certainly looking for that. I think I have such a personality of more, 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 like not in a you know, greedy way, but it's pushing myself that I can always be better. I can always contribute more. I can always be in better shape. I mean, all of it. Like, I think I was very much taught not to be content. So let's touch on that a little bit. Growing up, you have a Polish mom and a a Polish Ukrainian dad. What languages were spoken at home? So I didn't even speak English until I went to school, until I went to kindergarten or first grade. So I must have been six or seven. And my mom laughs that I was teaching myself by watching Sesame Street, (laughs) like trying to read. So I was a pretty early reader. And I remember being completely angry with my teacher that she didn't speak Polish. Like, who did she think she was? (laughs) I was just talking. (laughs) I know there's a big uh, Polish population in greater Chicago. Were you in a Polish community? I think it was more that my, my primary caretaker when my parents were working was my grandfather and he spoke no English, Mm -hmm. but I would say it was interesting. I was having this discussion with a VC friend who went to Northwestern. We were talking about Chicago and I said, there was definitely a big Polish community. We, that was part of our church, a lot, you know, great Polish Catholic churches in Chicago. But I think the Chicago I grew up in, like our neighbors were from Mexico, across the street from Lithuania. We had an Indian family. There was many kind of African-American families. It was so diverse and we all helped each other. Like, I think the common denominator wasn't culture or religion. It was very much, you know, we're all struggling. We're all hustling. We're in this together. The neighbors kept an eye on me. Like my mom was always cooking for our Lithuanian neighbors because they were older. I miss that. I think there's a loss of that now in any modern city. I loved that part of it. I think I was more shocked. Like when I moved to this, you know, eventually very American dream style, my mom got a great job. We moved to this fantastic suburb outside of Chicago. They built their own house there. And I remember being shocked that everyone was white. Everyone like got a BMW at age 16. <laughs> like, and it was the same color, you know, the same make. And it was so much more homogenous than I thought. And I, nothing against it. I actually had a fantastic experience in high school, but it was a culture shock for me. I was used to people speaking tons of different languages, learning to communicate physically over language. You know, you made it work. And I loved that about my childhood. So you speak Polish, Ukrainian, and of course, English. Uh, And is Ukrainian very different than Polish? If you're a Pole, can you get by with with your Ukrainian friends? Absolutely. I mean, I'm living in Warsaw now, and there are a lot of Ukrainian refugees here, of course. 
fantastic, hardworking people. And we get by, <laughs> like, I lost a lot of the Ukrainian, I speak Polish, but we understand each other. And we write, even in writing or verbally, it's pretty similar. We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers, bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion. 1-800-Flowers, share with love. You have this most interesting personal perspective, American immigration roots, speak Polish, Ukrainian, understand the cultures have lived in Denmark, lived in Sweden, a lot of time throughout London, Paris, all, all of Europe and beyond. And now uh, here you are in Warsaw that's dealing with this unbelievable situation. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of the invasion and we have a land war going on. Uh, we have a man who's emerged as this extraordinary world figure, and Valensky, and and his wife playing a very significant role in representing the people of of the Ukraine. You were concerned back at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, that there might be fatigue developing in the people of uh, Europe who were burdened with all these refugees, embrace them with open arms. But then, you know, that friction starts. And uh, wait a minute, why are they all standing on that corner there? And I'm going to work and uh, there's my school is overcrowded and I'm waiting online and a couple of the young guys got drunk and were inappropriate. What's happening with that enormous refugee? And here you are in Warsaw, a company that, is, that has accepted millions of Ukraines into their country to protect them. How are things going? I am very happy to say that I think I was completely wrong in that assessment. Even before I step into that, I will say, I don't speak in any political capacity, but Poland has stepped up beyond everyone's expectations and thoughts. It's really a hero. There's a lot of Ukrainians everywhere. Most of them are in Poland. <laughs> the lion's share. You walk down the street in Warsaw or Krakow, you hear Ukrainian just as much as Polish. And wow. people are embracing each other. I was doing a run, you know, past a cute outdoor daycare, and there were two teachers and they were speaking in both languages because there were so many Ukrainian kids. My daughter, I believe her grade had up to 30 new Ukrainian families come in mid semester. It's an incredible to watch. And I think so much so, of it. How many in the class can you say 30 new ones? Uh, uh, context to add for us. There's about 70 to 80 in the class. So that's that's a lot. And I think it's, you know, to give context, like, you know, if you are Eastern European in any sense, especially Polish, you grow up with stories like I did from my grandparents and later my parents of either World War II or communist occupation and the fear okay. and the paranoia and the cruelty and the breaking up of families and the deaths. I never in my life would think my daughter would be living in a Poland where there's a war on the border and there are tanks on the ground and rockets accidentally <laughs> fall over the border as they did you know, a few weeks ago here in Poland. Never, ever, ever, ever. But this is the situation I, we find ourselves in. And I think that history, Poland is, is it's a, it's a nation with a lot of compassion and heart. You know, people could fight and yell. And but at the end of the day, they believe in taking care of each other. And that's what I've seen here in Poland, to be honest. Like, I, you know, sometimes you worry that that initial excitement will fade of Americans yes. coming over, people saying, oh, I'm going to go pick up people from buses or house Ukrainians. Polish people are still doing that. Americans may not be coming over in droves anymore, but we have our own stuff going on. But that's still happening here. And I think it's, you know, I might have mentioned this story to you, but I remember I took my daughter to Krakow because uh, a guy called Dick Costello, who's the former CEO of Twitter, yeah, he's a great guy, he had come over to Krakow like on his own with his team and had bought up some Airbnbs and was picking up Ukrainians from the bus station and giving them a place to live. And he introduced me to two women that were teachers. There were a lot of children there that had been separated from their parents somehow. And these teachers had fled. And instead of bringing computers and things like that, they brought all their school books in Ukrainian because they wanted to make sure that the children were still learning and still learning and having pride in their culture, in Ukrainian culture and what Ukraine is doing. And I remember speaking to one of these teachers and she said, you know, 
We're not here to take. We want to work hard in Poland. We want to contribute to Poland. We want to have kids here that are raised well, and our Ukrainian kids will contribute to Poland and not cause trouble. And, and she was so passionate, I had tears in my eyes. And I think that's a bit what you were referring to. And it feels like a real brotherhood or sisterhood here um, between us. And it's quite beautiful. It's one of the most, I also did not think I would be <laughs> living through this kind of situation in history, but I think we'll all remember it for so long that this is humanity. This is what it should be like. There was just an announcement uh, that Poland is going to supply some tanks. Uh, question whether or not Germany will. It looks like they they might now. Uh, the U.S. indicated just uh, in the last uh, 12 hours or so that uh, yeah. we're going to provide yeah. some tanks. I mean, who would have thought that they would do what they did without any of those weapons when it all first started. I mean, it's Nothing short of amazing, miraculous. Like I don't, I can't imagine in history a similar situation. Um, the human spirit, you know, there's a there's a battle in Poland. It's a famous battle of Westerplatte. It's actually one of the first battles of World War II where. And I, I know this because my grandfather on my dad's side was a Navy man and on one of those ships. And it was a David and Goliath story where the Germans, the Nazis came in with like 10 times the ships uh, the Poles had and Poles had like a few, maybe two, we're not suspecting it and held them off for days and days and days. And I say that because it's great to have tanks and you know missiles and you know the Starlinks have been fantastic. But at the end of the day, it's that hard as nails as hell eastern european spirit that you create that fight in people that they will not be dominated it's my sister's birthday go to 100flowers.com they have tons of great birthday gifts wow wow, wow. happy birthday baby wow yummy i got to contain myself 1-800-Flowers celebrate the people you love you would have your thumb on the pulse to understand to to, to anticipate what impact that might have on those men uh, who are fighting the war, those people who are fighting the war on the front lines, knowing that their families are warmly embraced by their neighbors. I wonder how that contributes to their to their backbone and their spirit to uh, fight on. Enormous. I mean, you know this, we're both family people. And it's men left, but a lot of women too, who have their kids here or their sisters or their mothers to know that their relatives are not suffering psychologically, are not being disincluded, are not being spat at, are not being made fun of in the news or on the streets, to know that their kids are embraced in school, that's everything. It's just so remarkable. And I have, there's a lot of Ukrainians here as well that are still going back and forth, taking extremely long bus rides to bring back money or supplies to their daughters or whoever stayed back and coming back and forth. And I know the polls really help because you know traveling across the border is not always safe. And so there is just this enormous human generosity and spirit that's totally remarkable. <laughs> like we all need that a little bit in the world everywhere. You did a wonderful uh, interview with the DLD event. I think, was that in Berlin? In Munich, yes. Oh, Munich. Okay, uh, and and there you were you were drilling down on the impact that the internet in the last thirty years, the social media tools that ride on those rails, the impact that's having on the formation or the sustainability of democracy. Lots of talk about we on our earlier conversation about your kids, uh, the kids of today, my grandkids among them about uh, devices, lots of concern about the influence of TikTok on the minds and, and spirits of our, uh, of our young people. What do you see the impact where there is open access to internet dialogue capability along different social platforms? What impact is it having on democracy? And we certainly see the need for totalitarian governments to control their people's access Mm -hmm. to the internet because I think it undermines their ability to control the people. Absolutely. I mean, I had the, the pleasure of interviewing my friend Shervin Pishuar, who's kind of a mega investor um, and early in Airbnb and Uber and Tesla and a lot of these things and a close friend of Elon Musk's. And 
he's been very quietly involved as, as an Iranian American refugee himself, who was spectacularly successful in the US, been really involved in a lot of these things um, for the last decade. And he has a great term and he said, you know, the last bastion of dictatorship is the router. Uh, governments are using, as they always have in history, like rape, torture, hangings, executions. But I think that the blackouts and the lack of internet access, because the internet allows you not only to project to the world what's going on, the atrocities happening in your home, but helps protesters organize, can act as a safety valve, like don't go to this area, this area is dangerous. I mean, it's it's pretty horrific, I think. And I think what, what Elon has done, and Shervin was part of that too, with Starlink in Ukraine, there are now Starlinks in Iran, is just an interruption there. The Starlink uh, system, satellite, uh, micro satellite system, deployed over the Ukraine, uh, uh, providing communication capabilities to the population and to the uh, and to the military. Absolutely, I think that is almost as important as the tanks and the guns and things like that. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, I think it's going to be a problem. It's it's so fascinating because you remember this with Arab Spring and everything. You know, everyone thought Twitter would save democracy. And then when it didn't, was like very negative that social media is, is actually driving anti-democracy. But I think now we're seeing that innovation and the internet is such a powerful tool for freedom with Starlink, but there will be new innovations, new Starlinks and things like that. And, and I think, although we can argue that social media is deleterious for our kids, at the same time, I think you know, these countries are full of young people. What is it? The average age in Iran is, you know, most of the population is under the age of 23. Having access to see how the rest of the world lives and to get support from women around the world or other people around the world through social media makes this generation, I think, unstoppable. Gen Z, millennial, because they will, they refuse to live like that. Darling to me was in that interview uh, with your Iranian friend he said what's going on now in terms of these demonstrations in Iran, he said history will record at this moment transitioning from demonstrations, mostly mostly women uh, induced and involved, to now being a revolution. And I yeah. was startled by his comment there, as I noticed you were. No, and I mean, he believes that. And a lot of great thinkers um there's a great thinker on Iran called Karim Sajapur at Carnegie. I mean, it's extremely unpredictable, but what people thought would last a week or two has gone on for months. I mean, it's the biggest revolution since 1979. And it's a revolution about the core. You know, Iran is organized around basically three driving principles, hatred against America, hatred against Israel, and the hijab, repression of women, they have to be covered. That third pillar and probably one of the strongest organizing principles with the headscarves is being attacked. And I can't imagine women will accept it in the long term anymore. And so it's hard to say what will happen here, but you have, you know, no offense, but a, a nation run by a handful of men over 70 and a nation of, of young people who refuse to conform, who want dignity, who want freedom. And so... And I'm told, uh, you'll know better, but I'm told by people, uh, friends of mine or people I know here in the U.S. who are Iranian, there's a, a real kinship. Now, it's prejudice because they came to the U.S., but they say there's such an affinity between the Iranian Persian people and the uh, West, particularly the U.S., that can't be crushed by the mullahs and that it's just a natural yearning to be a lot like us. And that's what they want to control communications over so that that doesn't exactly. bubble up. Exactly. I mean, there's a extremely successful, large Iranian diaspora in the U.S. and they communicate sure on social media and support each other that way. There's a lot of journalists and people that fled, you know, after 1979 or even with the Green Movement that are supporting and helping and communicating back home. And so I think that, that that is very threatening to them, but that's why it's so important to have those lines of communication open. Let's round the third base here on uh, <laughs> on a subject I know that's really important to you and, and, and it's increasingly important to me. 
at Worth, uh, at Worth Media, really have turned our attention in the past uh, 18 months or so to the, the climate issue. You mentioned how uh, when you first got uh, to Denmark as a, as a student and then uh, working uh, in Sweden, uh, as you did both uh, on behalf of the government and then in private industry, that the Scandinavians have been on the forefront of mm-hmm. the uh, movement toward uh, climate mitigation and sustainability. Women are Worth event uh, in April in New York. And if there's any way you could be there, we'd love to have you on stage, help us with uh, so, so many of the topics you're so knowledgeable about to help grow the conversation. So I'll follow up with you on that. I would confess to you that I attended a Worth climate event in uh, in Mountain View, California, uh, just about a year ago. And it really opened my eyes. It scared the hell out of me about how bad the problem was. But it was a mixture of scientists, uh, climatologists, investors, and entrepreneurs in the climate space. So in the course of uh, 36 hours, I went from, oh, my God, you know, I went I went from what can me as a, a small businessman, uh, as a father, as a grandfather, uh, community member, what, what can I do about this climate issue? I'll, I'll, I'll recycle. I realized I had no right to think like that. I, I came away, even though frightened to death about how proximate, how how much evidence there is about what's been happening, uh, the number of carbon particulates in the air increasing by 50% in uh, in half my lifetime. Uh, it's you know, just so much evidence. The then being, wow, wait a minute, these scientists are really onto some interesting things here. And then finally saying, wait a minute, a couple of the smartest people in the world that I know most respect have turned their guns, their investment dollars and their knowledge and their know-how and their resources, making climate the primary focus of their life. Uh, Seth Godin, one of the great marketers of all time, saying he's only going to work on climate issues going forward. And he's he, he appeared at our Worth Climate event in New York in September in conjunction with UN Climate Week. Bill Gross, uh, one of the most oh, yeah. inventive, creative guys ever at Idea Labs, saying he's turned 100% of his investment activities, his brain power toward climate issues. And of course, John Doerr, the, the amazing venture capitalist who uh, just created the uh, Stanford mm-hmm. Doerr School of Sustainability at Stanford University uh, with a $1.1 billion endowment. These are people I just think the world of. And to have them, to, for me to catch their energy at this event about, this is now in a realm of it can be fixed, it's likely likely to be fixed because it's now the greatest business opportunity of their lifetime. To your point earlier, uh, from your experience in Scandinavia, it's becoming a movement. And it's coming from young people up, pushing old thoughts like me to say, wait a minute, I can and should be doing something about this. And you've worked with companies all over the world. And I know you're close with Nina and what she's doing at Milky Wire, providing the software for companies uh, to uh, develop their goals, uh, to develop the tactics to get there, to to, uh, put in place measurement capabilities that they can keep score on how they're doing and making sure what they're doing is effective. I feel a sense of movement coming here. Absolutely. And that's what it has to be. And I would say, you know, one of my greatest memories that I won't forget is I had the opportunity you know, when I was still working at my previous work, Brilliant Minds, to introduce President Obama and Greta Thunberg and be in the room listening, watching them engage and talk to each other. And, and I've met Greta. Um, it's a, it has to be a movement, but it can't just be young people. It has to be everyone. And that's sometimes, I mean, I'm an eternal os- optimist. <laughs> But the thing, the reason why Sweden is so far ahead or some of these European countries is climate is not political there. It's a fact, it's science. You know, in, in our country, it's it's politics. That's a big problem. It's just so culturally visceral there. I'll tell you, you know, from the business side and just the social side, there is a kind of cultural norm in Sweden called Alemansretan, which kind of basically translates to everyone's land, all of my land, which, what does that mean? If I have a beautiful house on some island in the archipelago and some woods in the back, 
or a beach out front, anyone can camp there, everyone's land. It's not trespassing, so I'm gonna put up a tent, et cetera. And I remember as an American thinking like, when I first heard this, are you crazy? They're gonna trash your thing. <laughs> People don't do that because there's a collective ownership sense. We all own the land. We all have to protect it. A community way of looking at the environment which I also am not sure we sometimes have <laughs> um, in the US. And on the business side, I think, I remember speaking to some incredible business leaders early on in Sweden, women like Antonia Axelson Johnson and the Wallenbergs and people like that. And when they think about, and I, I recall using the word sustainability and, and, and it was, she was a female business leader said to me, we stopped using that word like 20 years ago. It's not sustainability, it's called the future. <laughs> This is the future. And I think this is a lot of European companies and you would you would respect this family owned businesses. People aren't trying to make a quick buck or like quick shareholders, which are sure there's those pressures, but a lot of the Swedish business leaders I've met, including founders, you know, they think what what is my company going to look like? Not in five years, not in Q4, but in a hundred years. <laughs> And I want to pass this on to like the seventh generation, you know, and I think that sense of long term thinking is is quite rare. It feels very European and I think also drives business to be on the forefront of a lot of that. Um, they don't even have CSR programs in most Scandinavian companies anymore because it's so integrated into the core business. And I think yeah. that's a big differentiator and we really need like to find a common language around this in America. Um, it's not politics, it's not taxes, it's not this, it's how you described it. it. It's a great business opportunity, it's right, it's what we wanna give our kids, and it's science, it's a fact. <laughs> like it's not to be debated in the US Congress, this is science. I, I had a conversation last night with a friend, her name is Sarah Feinberg, used to run the MTA here in New York City. We were chatting about this climate issue and the question of when movements happen. Yes, it always looks like it's it happened accidentally, but lots of times there are levers being pulled that accelerate it and, and, and shape it. And she said to me, when I was a kid growing up in Charleston, West Virginia, uh, she said, we didn't have seatbelts until it became an issue for kids. And it was mm -hmm. us who made our mom and our dad put this seatbelt on. And when she said that, I said, yeah. oh, of course, I, I remember when I had little kids and they were the ones saying, daddy, you got to put your seatbelt on. So it oftentimes starts with kids who have a different sensibility. Uh, but I think now we're at the stage where I, I always think that here in, in the U.S. market that I know, when big business says this is important to us and we're going to do it, that's what really drives change. Absolutely. That's what institutions get on board. Everyone has a role here. And I'm embarrassed to tell you, it, it's only a year ago that I really had my eyes open to what my responsibility is, what our responsibility is as a family, as a company, as community participants. And I, I think you're right, and I hope you're right, but I think it's what a great opportunity for us to see through your eyes how it's not a movement in, in Scandinavia. It's it's become a part of their DNA, a part of their culture. And it's important that the whole the whole of the world gets there pretty soon. Two areas, you know, well, again, business, but also marketing, like storytelling it's a complicated issue i struggle to stay on top of like what's good to do what's not good to do how can i reduce my footprint how can i be a good citizen and i think we need to kind of tell that story better um, in an easily understandable way to kids and they are probably not going to get it at school because it's controversial and political but you know as parents or you know as big brands like we need to start making it understandable, sexy. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to look at it. And some people do it extremely well, some companies, some businesses, but we almost all have to unify around that. It needs to be a corporate movement too. Well, I suspect at the front of that movement will be a young lady I know. You advocate forcefully and elegantly for things that are important to you. And it's clear that in addition to women's issues and the greater political issues, the peace needs that the country has, that sustainability, climate issues are at the forefront of your agenda. And I, I'll be I'll be cheering uh, 
actively from the sidelines as you uh, play you a leadership role. Not with me, Jim. That's how we're gonna do it. <laughs> no, us old guys stay in the background. We push you, young kids, up front. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> Natalia, thanks for being so generous with your time and sharing with us your experiences. Uh, I can't wait for uh, my uh, my kids who are your age and my grandkids in particular. I'm thinking uh, I can't wait for my oldest grandchild. Her name is Abigail Abby, we call her. She's 14, so close in age to Aurora. I can't wait till they meet. And B, I can't wait for Abby and her sister to meet you and to listen to this and and learn from you because you're one heck of a role model. Oh, Jim, takes one to know one, I guess, if I'm one. But thank you so much. All right, this all like right get back to the get yeah. back to the, the order of the day. Makes uh, make a make a difference there in Warsaw today. I suspect you will. Thank you so much. See you hopefully in April. Bye, all Jim. right, thank you, my friend. We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers, bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion. 1-800-Flowers, share with love. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Celebrations Chatter. You can join our community by reaching out at chatter at celebrations.com. And while you're at it, tell us what topics you'd like us to explore here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to share it forward.